this works. <sighs> Fantastic. Um, welcome, everyone, to our session today. Uh, this session is called uh, Radical um, Imagining Fellowships for Dextran Digital Activists. Um, we're today uh, representing um, the Digital Constitutionalism Network and IT for Change here in the room. Um, the idea is that we're quickly introducing um, ourselves um, and the idea or the general idea of the session um, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. It's great that you came. It's very nice that you all took place at the table so that we have a, can have a conversation and this is what we imagine for the session anyways, to have a bit of an exchange because we have many things from you to learn about what kind of fellowships are useful and um, we're presenting the kind of thinking that we have on what kind of fellowships we think um, are useful for digital governance um, radically uh, reimagined. Uh, my name is Dennis Redeker. I'm a researcher at the University of Bremen and I'm also one of the co-founders of the Digital Constitutionalism Network that um, educates, um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a, in a, in a bit, but that educates uh, so far mostly students of or BA and MA programs, but has a mission too to do advocacy work. And then the question is how can we move into a space that allows us more to um, to, um, to educate um, scholar practitioners. Um, and I'm handing over the mic to you, Anita. Thanks, Dennis. So the starting point of my organization is uh, slightly converse, but I hope you know we achieve as much as university spaces do. I come from a nonprofit space where our work is to uh, contribute to social justice in many ways. And um, over the past several years, again, I will get into it in detail later on, we have worked on uh, capacity building for both uh, academics, practitioners, social movement um, uh, people, and also uh, those who want to be engaged in issues of digital rights, um, the digital economy and digital society, and uh, both at the level of organizing communities and at the level of policy change. Through that, we've had some insights on what it might take to uh, build um, the kind of institutional depth and traction that is necessary so that the digital rights debates are much more accessible uh, to regions and organizations that are under-resourced. So the session partly also addresses uh, this coming together of uh, two kinds of spaces so that we can co-design something from your experiences as well uh, for the next gen activists uh, and scholars who might want to contribute to the domain. So that's like a brief introduction. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hélène Molinier. I work for UN Women. Um, I'm managing the Action Coalition on Tech Innovation for Gender Equality. So very much here in both listening mode and really eager to see how, um, how we can find solutions to bring new voices to um, the digital cooperation stage, and especially uh, voices that bring a feminist lens and uh, have a strong interest in uh, a human rights um, approach to, to digitalization. So Thank you. Over to my colleague. Hi, everyone. My name is Ahmad Karim. I'm also from UN Women, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Um, I lead the work on innovation uh, campaigns and uh, advocacy and the U.S. portfolio within uh, Asia and the Pacific. Hello, everyone. My name is Manu Emanuela. Uh, I'm from Brazil. I was a youth from Internet Society and from the Brazilian Steering Committee, and today I work with children's rights and specifically allowing children to participate in this kind of debate as well uh, at Instituto Alana. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Alice Lana. Nothing to do with Instituto Alana. <laughs> uh, I'm a mentor for the Brazilian Youth Group today uh, in IGF, and I, I would like to excuse myself in advance because we have uh, a meeting for the Youth Brazilian Group at five, so I will live in the middle of the conversation. But um, I'm I'm really glad to be here because I think that's exactly the kind of discussion it, we need to be having about having youth not on the menu but sitting on the table and and discussing. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Christian Leon. I'm from Bolivia. I'm the current executive director of uh, Internet Bolivia Foundation and secretary of Al Sur. That is a uh, coalition of 11 uh, civil society organizations working towards 
promoting digital rights in Latin America. I'm here just to 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 learn, and if I have something, I will share it with you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ariel McGeed. I am a program officer with Internews for their Asia region. Um, I work primarily with women and youth-led civil society organizations, media, um, and media adjacent CSOs, journalists, and am about kicking off a project on human rights-centered internet governance. And so we are actually, as part of that, have a large fellowship program. Um, so curious to hear what you guys have learned and how we can implement that um, going forward. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Faye. I'm currently a master's student in Taiwan. And I um, sometimes work with or for Dennis and I'm considering doing a PhD uh, with him. Yeah, I'm just interested in what you're gonna talk about. Hey, my name is Raimundo Quilombo. I live in Quilombo Rampa, Vargem Grande Maranhão. I work da Rádio TV Quilombo Rampa, uma organização que surgiu na comunidade, né, como uma forma da própria comunidade contar a sua própria história através da comunicação popular. Né? Então, uma, a gente criou uma TV dentro da comunidade com o próprio recurso, né? É uma comunicação que a gente chama de dentro para dentro, que é a comunicação ancestral. A gente está aqui para participar e trocar essa experiência com todo mundo que está aqui presente. I'm going to translate for him. Uh, Raimundo, he's from, he's a quilombola from Quilombo Rampa in, in San Luis do Maranhão, Brazil. He created the radio and TV Quilombo at his community, which is, um, which they um, define as a inside to inside communication. And, que mais tu falou da comunicação de dentro para dentro? He's, and he's a popular communicator. We're here together today. Uh, I'm Barbara Leodora. I'm from Article 19, Brazil. Uh, and I am responsible for a campaign of, of ours that we created in the time of the pandemic, which is a campaign which provides fellowships for popular communicator, communicators in the whole country, where they can provide um, knowledge and information and we had two editions to 2020 2001 for popular communicators to inform the, the the public about the pandemic and then we had one last year for the elections because we figured it was a uh, an effort to guarantee <laughs> to some to the efforts to guarantee that it would happen, our elections, and it did. And right now we're having a SCAZU agreement edition. So we're here to learn and exchange experiences on this fellowship because it's a, it's a great thing we, we've done. I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud to be here, excited. Hi, my name is Oscar Jimenez, Oscar Mario Jimenez. I'm from Costa Rica in Central America. I work in University of Costa Rica in a research center that promotes uh, freedom of expression and digital rights. And also I am executive director of MIO. It's Museum of Identity and Pride. It's an initiative to recovering the memory of LGBT history in Central America. So I love the the title of session, so I, he, he, I'm here to learn. I, um, I'm Ev Gourmand. I'm a PhD candidate at the Montreal University in Canada. I'm also a guest researcher at Keio University here in Tokyo. I uh, work in AI and human rights, um, and my dissertation focuses on uh, the impact of AI on the right to higher education under uh, international human rights law.
Um, so one of the first things we like to do, because we know that sometimes um, when uh, it's getting toward the end of a session, uh, people have to leave um, or one forgets. We have a small survey uh, that we'd like to show you, Link. If you could fill it in, that would very much help us to uh, better understand what demands and interests are of people in, um, uh, in fellowships. We, these are also questions that you can answer in there uh, in case you run a fellowship or in case you provide funding for a fellowship. Just to get some resources together, we'd like to learn from this. Uh, as we develop own own models. And we're going to show the link in a second. It's a short link. I just wanted to say that it's, it's a very short survey. Uh, and if you can leave your email IDs, we'll be happy to also share uh, the analysis of the survey with everybody. That's precisely to account for the conflicting priorities we sometimes have at the IGF, and therefore you know, the voices are not uh, carried right through till the end. So that is the link, and I'm going to also circulate this. Um, please write in, uh, you know, uh, a little bit like bold or something, uh, cap capitals. I'm not very good at deciphering handwriting. So I'll start from here. Would you be interested in receiving a copy of the, yeah. Um, do you need a pen? Yes. So soon after, we can open up uh, the session. So we probably take about five, ten minutes for this. And one comment to those um, online, um, welcome again. And you're obviously also welcome to fill in the survey um, and let us know your email um, addresses. I will post mine, so this is most privacy preserving. I'll just post post my email, is that, does that make sense? Post my email here in the in the chat and then you can send me an email with your email address or just send me an email and we'll send you the results as well. So how is everyone doing on the survey? Uh, finishing up? Okay, wonderful. I just want to make sure. Um, then I'm going to share my slides. I'm quickly going to say something about the current activities, and then we jump into our exchange. Um, uh, so let me share these. Um, as I said, um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Digital Constitutionalism Network, founded in 2019 um, in Bochum, Germany, um, by academics from um, mostly Europe, but also from around the world. We've had people from, uh, currently people from uh, all continents represented in the, in the network, and the network is focused on um, research, but also teaching and training. That's what we're going to talk about today, and advocacy that's also related to today uh, in the field of human rights uh, and the internet. Well, obviously, that's the focus here. Um, we run a database on digital bills of rights, um, so documents that proclaim rights and rights and principal claims. Uh, we have now a database, I'll show this in a sec, but we have a database of 308 uh, documents um, that we have assembled. It's a, it's a great resource that's or research activities. Um, but we also have a, an annual teaching partnership, which we now uh, do online and in person. And we are um, now currently planning for long term one year uh, research incubators to be conducted. Um, this is uh, how the database looks. You can check it out. It is, I think, a helpful research uh, tool also for advocates, for advocacy, uh, to see what other documents are out there that demand uh, human rights and principles uh, on the internet in a digital field, also related to AI. Um, and this database here is going to be updated very soon. Um, we do research with this. Um, just last week, we spent a week with students from across Europe in, uh, in Italy in order to teach um, human rights online using, among other things, these documents and the database. Um, and going forward, the Digital Constitutions Networks, a network um, not only wants to partner with additional partners, and we're working with IT for Change, for example, um, we're open to, to other partnerships, um, but we, we're thinking about, on the one hand, how can we combine um, the, the teaching that we do with our students into um, translating knowledge to activists, to young activists who come in and who can benefit from this interchange. Our idea is to create year-long research incubators uh, by which people from different ways of life, um, walks of life, can, can join. Um, they're being uh, supported by uh, members of, of the network and of partners, by expert advisors, um, there will be MA and PhD students among those who, who receive or who part of this fellowship um, cohort, uh, but also members of civil society groups, uh, NGOs, 
or independent young researchers. Um, so that's um, pretty much our, our pitch or our idea. We're still working on this, um, again, working with IT for Change. Um, but we want to be more open. We'll have some, some more open discussion, not on this, but just on the things you all do and, and, and the things that, that you can advise us also on, on uh, doing when we pursue uh, such a scholar-practitioner route um, for teaching, which is something new for most of the people at universities. We often are geared toward the BA, MA, MA programs that we have, but we often neglect, I think, the people that would otherwise have, a, have an opportunity to, to, um, to also gain academic knowledge, but who have a background in an uh, NGO or civil society organization uh, or any other place, really, uh, media organizations, for example. So much, Dennis. I just wanted to add a couple of things. This is, I think, the 18th IGF, and in many ways, even five years ago, if you actually looked at uh, people working uh, in the grassroots on various issues uh, that uh, occupy the time and energies of social movements, you would find that they don't understand what digital rights are. They don't perhaps engage with those issues in uh, such a palpable way, but I think very rapidly since the pandemic, that situation has changed. And although uh, there used to be the idea of digital activism or using digital spaces for activism, in the past few years, movements have begun to embrace the idea that their own issues are beginning to be redefined by digitalization. So those who've been working on education, for instance, have had to grapple with edtech technologies and uh, others, for instance, in the health domain are quite worried about what happens to health data and cross-border data flows, et cetera, et cetera. Trade justice activists are really grappling with the idea of you know, um, trade agreements and uh, algorithmic non-transparency in developing countries because of free trade agreements. So the, the field is changing and younger people are beginning really to understand and grapple with these issues. And by that, I don't mean to overgeneralize who these youth are, but I think broadly, talking about those who normally um, are part of um, the very, very fabric of struggle and dissent in their own contexts, and people who are really showing the way um, in terms of the pluralistic dimensions of uh, human rights that uh, we would really like to present, right? So we have, uh, at IT for Change, done two rounds of, uh, uh, you know, I would say mentoring of fellows. You know, one was on the digital economy and uh, gender through a feminist lens. And that was very rewarding. The other one was a in situ uh, one week fellowship program that we did in Thailand uh, earlier this year, which was called uh, Frames and Frontiers for Digitality. If you would have two minutes, maybe you can say something from your, uh, and you could maybe the two of you that have to go, is, is, it, is it already time? Okay, I wouldn't, it's already five. Yeah, I understand. So. Uh, that's fine. So on the frames and frontiers uh, for digitality, you know, we really found it uh, extremely useful that we brought people who are mid-career professionals from different uh, organizations, and they had a lot uh, to say about how they would shape their programs. And the programs that they were holding either as uh, officers in, let's say, large organizations that were working on poverty and development, or organizations that were working on digital rights. So these were very instructive. One of the things that came out was, um, are the existing fellowships for digital rights um, leading us in a way to a kind of uh, individualized paradigm where institutional strengthening is not happening? You know, that was one of the questions that tech fellowships typically tend to privilege certain kinds of uh, fellows who may not then contribute back or uh, the entire structure of these fellowships may not allow the contribution uh, you know, of their work to, you know, sustain social movements. So the uh, effectiveness of these fellowships was something uh, that was called to question, and that's a problematic, uh, you know, just a provocation to analyze. And I just wanted to put it on, on the table. We just have two broad questions for the session, and uh, maybe, Dennis, you can... Yes, um, so, so there are obviously uh, many questions that we have. We have proposed two things to discuss, and we're very happy if you bring in your other questions and your questions um, for discussion. The first one here, um, also on the screen, would be, what does the current landscape of funding and fellowships uh, for young activists working in the digital spaces look like? So what is, what is out there? So what can we um, kind of collect also here as a, as a, as a brainstorming? Um, who, wants to, who wants to start?
Hey everyone, I think I'm gonna share a little bit about the youth programs that I've been uh, a fellow and how they are organized. So it's not exactly funding, but more like fellowship. And the first one I had a, a course. And one thing that I think it's really important to think about is mental health during this kind of procedure. Why? Because it, uh, the two programs that I participated, they had a competition vibe. So people were really competing against each other to be able to reach this opportunity and this caused a lot of problem. So this is an issue. I think another one is the fact that the courses, they are very difficult and they are online. So you have the accessibility things and something that makes me wonder if the most vulnerable people, they are able to reach this opportunity. And even the, the fact that it's very difficult for understanding like infrastructure issues and understanding this debate and then competing against each other to be able to get the fellowship. So all of these, I think, are things that we have to face it. Another thing that I think uh, that the programs today, they allow you to reach opportunities. Like I went to the 2018 IGF and this is the only reason why I'm here today. Like it changed my life because I saw this is what I want to do. I want to participate in this space. But uh, you don't have a lot of continuity to be able to, in these programs, at least in Brazil, from my perspective, to be able to continue your engagement. So what I did was I will go after civil society and the NGOs that exist, and I will try to get a job. And that's basically what I did. But you, I don't see a lot of youth-led organizations in that sense that are like, oh, let's empower youth. And because of this program, let's do an organization. And I think there are a few aspects of this, like the importance of project management skills and skills to you know go after funding and do risk assessments, all of these things that we know that it is important for a lot of to apply to a lot of grants. And these programs they do not uh, help you with this kind of skills and the abilities. So this would be very important to empower people through fellowships so that they can form organizations. And another, the last one, why I think this is so important, is because the landscape of civil society in Brazil today, a lot of organizations, they are funded by big techs. And well, if you are funded by the private sector, you have a few particularities on your, the fact on what you can do, on what you can speak, even if it's very open, but well, you are funded by them. So the importance of having freedom and uh, not the chilling effect in that sense of the funding opportunities that we have. So these are a few of my considerations. I think that, and I think that is very transformative to be able to participate in this kind of event. And this should continue, but also allow to more long-term engagement. And for alumni network, like how alumni can become uh, mentors and that they can help and engage people with their experience and build, well, futures, alike. So that's, I think I, I approached the two questions a little bit and maybe later I can share some other thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, with the UN Women Regional Office for Asia Pacific, we have kind of uh, designed a very different model for a fellowship. It's uh, more of like a flexible combination of fellowship to a forum to an experience and mentorship program that runs for a whole year. Uh, instead of a short term. Um, so we have this group, we call the 30 for 2030. Uh, every year we select 30 from across the region, different uh, field of experiences, and where they, from UN Women's side, we give them a capacity building program, a mentorship with our advisors, connection with the country offices, so they have you know, the data and evidence um, and the strategic overview of the organization of what's happening in the region, but also connected to the country offices and where the implementation is happening. Uh, but that doesn't stop there. So that's more of like a preparation phase. Uh, and those group are amazing. They are like leaders and activists and CEOs of companies and researchers. Um, so what do we do with them after that? Um, we work with them in co-creation. So they co-create campaigns. Uh, we Right now we're launching an online toolkit on online uh, GBV, um, co-designed with them. Uh, and it, you know, what's really unique about the work that they do, that they want to create a knowledge product as, an, uh, as a living system. So it's not just a knowledge product that will put it in the shelf, put it online and, and forget about it. 
No, we update it every year. So last year we launched one version. This year we're updating, adding more forms of violence, for example, um, innovation, the stakeholders who are working on it, um, and then building campaigns um, and uh, other initiatives on the ground. It's being translated into nine languages right now in, in the region. Um, and then other experiences that you know some of our members would do really like that the, the some flexibility to attend their own preference um, events or forums, conferences. Um, so they get to select some of those events and we support them, whether it's financially or with nomination, to attend some of the big forums. Uh, we also nominate them to be speaking on uh, decision-making forums, like big conferences, CSW, the General Assembly. Uh, so it's kind of a pre-selected group where we invest on them, but at the same time, they are actually the one who is giving us their expertise and what, what, what they know. And then at the end of the year, they have the choice to stay uh, for another year as more of a senior fellow and then mentor the other ones who is coming and be part of that pool of opportunity. Or they can just move on, uh, but all of them, they decided to stay. Um, yeah, so I think it's one, one good you know, practice that we find it, that, that flexibility um, to give to, especially for young activists. A lot of them, they're studying, they have their work, they're doing other amazing things, and I think it should be giving them the flexibility to come in when they need to, uh, pull out when they need to get attention to other work in their life, especially if they're not like paid or will pay it for some of that work, uh, to take a break when their mental health is needed, and I think they, they have that, when they have that flexibility, they give you 200% of their time because they come at their own terms. Um, also getting them involved in practical challenges and giving them real life uh, experiences that they relate to it um, and they don't have to attend other things that is not of their expertise or, um, or relevance. Um, I think, I mean from our, we have a privilege at the UN organization where we can nominate them to large scale decision making processes and I think this is where they see the value of sitting with minister and head of states and be able to communicate you know, the reality of their life. Um, and I think it's very different when they say it than when we say it or when older people say, oh yeah, I was young once, I know what you feel. Like, no, you're not. This is a different reality and I think it needs to be said um, by them uh, themselves. Thank you. Uh, I could afford two more minutes and, <laughs> and came back, so because the this panel is really uh, very interesting. So I, I I'm glad that I can uh, help. Um, I can collaborate as well. Um, just to go really really quickly on these these two questions. One thing that I I do feel that I miss in some of the funding processes is the ability for the person who's being funded to participate in the design of the process, to, to be heard, not, not only be, be uh, thrown into the process as a tool that will be uh, sent uh, through all the, the phases, but someone who, whose opinions will, will also be listened to, and in this way they will <laughs> even engage more, right? They will feel that their opinion, not only on the content, but on, on the process as well, is valuable. And um, maybe uh, for the funders, they, they will not get exactly the results they wanted, they envisioned, but maybe they will get a better result in a, a different form. So I think that's um, one, one approach that I, I would like to bring. Another thing that I think uh, relates to what we're talking here is we have to have this balance between mentoring and trust. Because I think it's important when you're talking about funding to have someone who's um, there for the process and listening and helping, but there also must be trust in the sense of flexibility and 
understanding that um, the person who is being funded or the organization who is being funded is not like an empty vessel that needs to be filled. It also has uh, their, exper their experiences and uh, a lot to teach as well, not, not only learn. Um, so I think I <laughs> kind of give this overview on the, the issue, but it, if I had to, to choose two words, they would be the, this balance between um, guidance or mentoring and trust in the, the person who's there. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to talk about our, our experience in Article 19 Brazil. Um, this this campaign started in 2020 with the pandemic. We had this um, this money that we would use to activities and uh, things that we're doing in person, and we couldn't anymore. So we figured we would um, reroute this to popular communicators because we figured they were the most qualified people to inform the Brazilian people on the state of the pandemic and what we should and shouldn't do, especially because at the time we had a government that was spreading misinformation. <laughs> so we had to come back that. And uh, I took some notes on things that we're proud of in this program that we were, um, we kept doing and uh, making it better. So the first thing is, not, is that it's not technically a uh, digital rights fellowship, but it's also r extremely related to it because all of these um, fellows, they do what they do online. They do what they do digi digitally. They do what they do using uh, technical things, um, technology. So, and also we are <laughs> thinking about a next edition specifically on digital rights. So <laughs> that's, uh, I hope it, we can do it. Uh, the first thing we realized at the time is that we couldn't have rules for the spending of the money. This is because, firstly, it was a pandemic and people were without uh, their jobs, they were without their, their uh, normal lives and everything else. And also because in Brazil we have a very extensive territory and ex extensive different realities. So we figured we couldn't have uh, rules on like, oh, we sh we, you have to spend this money on uh, buying stuff to produce the information. You have to spend this money on this or and not that. Because we had people at the time using the money to pay bills. So this was the first rule that we, we decided on. And it w I think it's the most important one. I think it's the most um, valued rule or non-rule <laughs> that we have uh, in this program and that people appreciate more. And I think it this, um, this created a trust between us and our, our fellows. And, uh, and I think it's about respect too because I think it's, it's we're trusting them to do, you can do whatever you want with it. You just, we're just trusting you're going to keep doing what you're doing that is communication, qualified in communication. Um, and this is about uh, respecting their identities, it's about respecting their agency and their autonomy and their realities because we figure we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't, also in the format of the productions, like we couldn't tell them, oh, you need to do a three minute video because each reality was different. We had people that were doing things that um, were not necessarily as we think about popular communication because there were dialogues with indigenous people. There were dialogues with Quilombola territories. So uh, I am very proud <laughs> to, to tell this every time we have new fellows to say, no, we're respecting uh, your identities, we're respecting your autonomy and it's also great to see the reaction to it. Um, also capacity building, this was something that we implemented over the editions, uh, and the last one and this one we have courses and workshops and you know, creating, um, creating this, this capacity 
for them to produce what they produce already so well, uh, but in specific things. Also, the community network building. Uh, we see the campaign and the fellowships as a group, so we also uh, have WhatsApp groups so we can communicate because they're all over Brazil. And this, and they also cited is, uh, this already, this creation, to, um, uh, community creation, this where they also participate in the design of the program. They also take the see, make decisions with us um, on what they're doing on the results of this. And lastly, um, the active engagement of the fellows in, with the rest of the organization. Art Com Brazil 19 has four or five thematic areas and they all uh, interacted with the fellows all throughout the campaigns, all throughout the editions. We call them to give interviews, we call them to new projects, we call them to things that aren't necessarily part of the fellowship program, but they, we are engaging them with the Article 19 all of the time. And I think that's it. And mutual learning, which was also already cited because we love to hear what they felt about the, the edition, about the fellow, and then implement uh, new and better things in the next editions every time. I think that's it. Thank you. Short, yeah. Um, I'll build upon, upon what have been said there. Uh, there's two things that I found super interesting. The first one uh, being um, trust and if you want to um, maybe, maybe trust us and maybe you'll get something better than what we, you were expecting. Um, and I think that is something that is extremely valuable as a comment because um, oftentimes I feel like when you have to apply to fellowship, uh, you have to say like in a year I'll be working on this on that or that. Technology is fast paced. Um, it's hard to be capable of working on this, the thing you said you would be working on. Uh, when you apply, so trusting fellows and allowing them to work on whatever they want to work on, um, oftentimes it gives good result, I think, I hope so. Um, and the second thing is uh, mental health and uh, competition. Um, this is something that we like at least as academic um, family community, and if fellowships were able to provide that to create a sense of community and solidarity between people, I think it would be super interesting. And I have noticed that it often happens when you don't have people who all look the same, when you have people that are quite different, that come from uh, a different uh, field of expertise, different countries, and the competition is less pre present in those circumstances because you, have to, you can learn from one another uh, instead of competing with each other. Thank you very much. I'm just looking online, is there anyone online who want to do intervene? Doesn't seem to be the case. We do have a few minutes uh, left. Does anyone want to comment again? Come again or? I think I feel like we can uh, if somebody wants to follow. Yeah, I, I sent a, a message and asked. Um, no, it doesn't seem to be anyone online. Um, any questions here in the room? I can add maybe one more. Please. <laughs> Thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I think one, one thing that we learned also from the past experiences is that uh, engaging the fellows in the redesign of programs is very important um, and having them to be part of the governance of the program itself. I mean, what, what we did is that we chose a group. I mean, we got a nomination from the group itself to be part of the redesign of the next phase. Uh, so from they draw from their experiences of what worked, what haven't, what would they recommend? What they have like, you know, loved to do more on this kind of activity, and then we picked up those and we made them the core of of the group. Um, also, when we including them in the selection process, so there was also a group that we asked them different representation from the group to be part of the selection process of the next fellows. 
uh, that you know gave us a little bit of uh, well first they knew a lot of those people they gave us more insights and they also had more like less bias and they brought that um, perspective of they are in the same level so they know what you know certain people would say but also they could feel that you know certain fellows that doesn't have the you know the capabilities to market themselves because a lot of you know great people are too modest uh, but they also know about some of their great work. And they were like saying, like, no, we know like that person is like really amazing and they're doing this, but they did not mention this on, on their application. And that was really helpful to have on the ground validation of, um, of uh, our members. And I think that's really helpful to have that check from from the ground and, and um, the connection and involved and, and re redesign the program every time you get like a chance to um, to do it. And I think having um, mutual responsibility in the management also re like really help. Well, it elevates some of the workload from us, but it gives us also more chances to get that responsibility. So they also feel from the perspective of the management of the fellowship or the program, what is happening and why certain decisions are made this way. But by including them, we also get insights of other ways to do it. Um, or it could be easier or faster. Sometimes it's not faster, but at least when we make a decision together, it's common responsibility. And people feel good about it because it's our own decision. We're in this together. So, you know, when it's, there is that freedom to make the decision together, it takes time, but it really helpful to just get it, um, to get them all on board on this decision that they might be affected by. Thank you so much, everyone, actually. I, I'm, if I can may just reflect very shortly on the on our current plans and, and what I've heard. This is so inspiring to to hear these things, things that we partly haven't thought about so much. We can, we, I think, um, as a digital constitutionalism network and also with the cooperation, we can learn a lot. I mean, thinking about uh, participation and governance coming from a university setting that often is assumed. So when we, when we teach, we know there are formal uh, roles for students to have in university governance. But if we branch out and if we engage other stakeholders, then this doesn't necessarily apply. If we think about this being open as a training for civil society, it doesn't mean that people are um, immatriculated into the university, so they don't have the same rights necessarily. So we need to develop new governance mechanisms, and we can be more, I think, flexible in that sense with new mechanisms that might even be better um, than the ones we have. And, and so many things that I haven't actually thought about, like the, the, qu the question of, um, and your, your solution to the question of um, competition being people from different places that really doesn't put them in the kind of competition. I mean, you in, in Asia Pacific have this automatically if you take one person or two from, from each country. Um, so this, this was really, really, really um, helpful for us to think this through. And uh, we were developing this, we're submitting this for, uh, for grant applications and we'll also update everyone uh, who submitted the email uh, address uh, today if there's something coming through. Uh, and anyways, we'll be taking, well, after taking notes, or we've taken notes, we'll put this on the, the on the IGF website, obviously, after the session, um, and you'll get the survey results. Anita, is there anything you want to say? I just want to thank everybody for being so generous with your reflections, because I think there is a wealth of experience coming from different standpoints, and thank for, thanks for the candid feedback and your time to fill in the survey. Thank you. <laughs>